I just want to say a little bit about the ITUC so that everybody understands what it is. <laughs> Uh, and what it's not. Uh, well, uh, <laughs> the uh, ITUC is the International Trade Union Confederation. Yes. Um, and it is the, what I would call the apex organization, the uh, International Federation of National Trade Union Centers. And that means, for example, if you are here in Britain, it would be the Trades Union Congress. In the Philippines, it might be Centro. In, where else, where else are we from? Uh, <laughs> Germany, it would be the DGB. Uh, so it's the national centers. Now, of course, in some countries, you've only got one national center. In other countries, you may have many. <clears throat> but they are all members of the ITUC. And it originally was called it was made, of, made up of two uh, competing centres internationally, which merged a few years ago. One was the International Confederation of Free Trade Unions, which is basically the Social Democratic, Democratic Socialist, uh, whatever, however you want to call it, uh, federation. And the other was the World Council of Labour, which is the, the old Catholic uh, federation. And they merged together to form the ITUC um, a few years ago. It meets an, in a congress every four years and representatives of your national centres gather together in a big conference and they debate policy and they elect a leadership and the um, leader, the current general secretary, the leader of the ITUC is Sharon Burrow. Uh, who is an Australian originally, I think from a teacher's union originally, but so she is, if you like, the most, the, the sort of top representative in the world of, in some ways, the trade union movement, uh, as represented by the trade union centres nationally. Uh, just to say what they do, um, they basically, their main responsibility is representing our interests as trade union members throughout the world, to bodies like the ILO, the World Bank, the World Trade Organization, and many other intergovernmental organizations. They also run campaigns for trade union freedom, and so on and so forth. They uh, run education programs to support the development of national trade union centers in some countries around the world. Um, and uh, what else do they do? Uh, oh, they basically, every year, for example, they publish um, a, a guide of trade, the violations of trade union rights around the world. Okay, they, they do that sort of work. Um, what else to say about them? They're based in Brussels. Uh, they have a, a secretariat of, I don't know, how many people do we think? 50 people? Something like that, I would imagine. Maybe less. 40 or 50 people are the staff based in Brussels, overseen by Sharon. Regional. And then they have regional structures uh, for each, so Asia, Africa, Latin America, um, and so on and so forth. Um, anything else we should know about the ITUC before we start? They don't have a structure in Europe because of the ITUC. That's right, yes. Well, they sort of do, but it's a bit complicated. In Europe, it's difficult because there's an ETUC, which is actually independent of the ITUC, which makes life very complicated. <laughs> okay, um, so I'm just going to hand over. Are we online? Um, I'm speaking to Sharon, but um, she hasn't actually joined the conversation yet. So give me just a second. So just to explain the format, uh, we will have we've allocated until three o'clock for this. Um, we have asked the commission to come up with a sequence of questions that they want to put to Sharon Burrow. So she won't be making a speech. She will be simply responding to questions that the Commission have been working on uh, over the week. And then after those questions, if she's still online and she still wants to continue, then it will be thrown open uh, to the floor to ask questions then. And Anna, I believe you're chairing. Yes. Is that right? Yes. So I shall ha simply hand over to you. Oh. <coughs> Any questions about the ITUC? No? We're okay? We all know what we're talking about? Great. Thanks, Anna. Yeah, so I suppose we just wait until we get the connection. And uh, 
just to tell you the history of these questions, all these questions are related to the topic we have been discussing uh, during these three days. And actually we tried uh, to pick a question almost from every session and we have the list of seven questions and uh, let's see how it will go. Okay. Anything else to say? Hi. Hello. Hello. Hey. Hello. Hey. hey, Sharon. Hello, Sharon. Hello. Yes, uh, sorry for technical problems, uh, but finally we're here. Uh, my name is Anna Bolsheva, I'm from BWI, and uh, I'm going to chair this uh, session. And thank you very much for giving us opportunity to ask your questions and get your opinion uh, on the topics we have been discussing here for three days already. Uh, so, uh, we have a list of uh, questions and uh, uh, we have here a group of uh, young active people, we call ourselves Commission, and uh, during these days we try to formulate uh, questions for you. Uh, so we uh, will ask this question first and uh, then the floor will be open for everyone to make contributions and also ask questions. And to start uh, our discussion, uh, I would like to ask you the first question that we have been uh, discussing here, and that is about the role of global unions. We uh, talked uh, and discussed uh, what uh, role do unions play now on the global level, uh, what, union, what role should unions play in the future, and in this respect we would like to know where do you see the future of global unions in transforming society for the benefit of working people? <laughs> that is kind of how we change the world in uh, five minutes, yes? <laughs> Two minutes. <laughs> Two. <laughs> well, I suppose the, the, there's a prior question really. Is the world now so integrated that we can't solve the dilemmas and indeed the victimisation of workers and their rights in many, many countries around the world separately. So of course national action, local action becomes uh, even more important. But if it has a global frame, which the current dominant economic model does, the result of the current dominant economic model is indeed massive inequality, massive unemployment, and it's now at risk of becoming structural unemployment, and for the younger people, uh, the potential of a lost generation in terms of the dignity of secure work. And of course, if it is also uh, at the point where the resources of the 99% are so limited, this is not just about inequality, but about uh, a distributional share versus the 1% just to be uh, populist about it, then that's a global phenomenon. And so we are interconnected because if we want to realise our power, to realise the power of working people, their families, their community allies, then we have to do what is a very old uh, saying of the global environment movement, uh, think global, act, act local. I think we have to go beyond that and also act globally so that we aggregate our power from every uh, local or national uh, site to a global level where Frankly, politicians, policy makers can't ignore us and uh, fight of working people as they are subs as they are consequently doing now as a result of the dominant model we face. So the role of so there's a rationale, I suppose, for global unions that is critical. For the global union movement, then clearly we are a um, a family with mixed structures. We have all of the global affiliates in the ITC, but we have also got uh, the affiliates of our affiliates in their sectoral or industrial sector unions, the Global Unions Federation. And we work very closely as a group of secretaries across the ITC and indeed the Global Union Federation. And if any of you were at our recent Congress, you would have seen that integration in practice, particularly in the union growth section around organising. So, the role today is to, to actually make the case and represent workers at the global level, but make the case for the kind of uh, campaigns that will change the lives of working people, 
but to do it in cooperation with the movement in their own workplaces at local and, of course, at representative level in the nations as well as across the world. The future? I don't know that the role will change that much. I think the issues we deal with will change dramatically, not the core issues of um, social protection, minimum wages, collective bargaining, fundamental rights, but the context in which we're dealing with them will certainly change. And maybe I can give you a one-minute flavour of that by saying to you that the major outcomes from our recent Congress are a commitment to building workers' power and underneath that the central objectives of union growth, organising to grow the movement, and we've set targets on that, but making sure that everything we do is focused on working with, with working people, so organising them to realise rights, particularly in the most vulnerable countries, and, of course, organising workers to demand uh, social protection, fair minimum wages or minimum living wages, and, indeed, uh, uh, collective bargaining rights and outcomes. So when you look at those issues and think we've just been through two weeks of planning, so in fact we're in the middle of it now, which is why this is a bit truncated for me, I'm sorry, but we've now determined that we have three front lines and subject to our general counsel endorsing these, they are to tackle the dominant model of trade, supply chains, with a focus on minimum wages and indeed uh, um, formalising the informal sector, which is threatening decent work. We, uh, we are going to look at clearly at climate. You have to look at not just climate uh, justice in terms of a global agreement and the just transition measures we've negotiated at the global level, but indeed the implementation of those, and then the industrial transformation, which will be massive. This is the biggest structural um, uh, uh, or systematic structural uh, um, transformation that we'll see in our lifetime. It doesn't mean we won't have traditional industries. We will. We just have to green them up. We have to make sure that it's a bit like the generic medicine fight. There's universal access to low-carbon technologies and we're building the jobs of the future. So when we're negotiating, for example, the resource productivity alongside the traditional view of labour productivity in collective agreements, then we will know there's been a shift, a dramatic shift in the way people think about living within our planetary boundaries. And of course, the third one is something that is fundamental, absolutely fundamental, and we've raised it to a global scandal by shamelessly using Qatar, but uh, we, we want to tackle the elimination of slavery and forced labour. And having negotiated the recent um, uh, forced labour protocol at the ILO, we now want to see that ratified, workers organised and indeed given their rights. And then we have major themes that of course will continue with our countries at risk program, migration, our organising work, our economic and social policy and so on. But I think you can see that increasingly there's a, a current role for unions but we must be focused on the future of work, the future of the planet and how that will shift some of the demands on uh, on union activity. Not sure that helps, but thank you. There was general perspective, and uh, that what was what what question was about. And uh, now we have more specific questions. Uh, and uh, actually, you mentioned a lot of uh, topics in your first answer, on which we want to talk a little bit more. And uh, our second question is actually about Qatar. And I give floor to Sasha. Yes. Introduce yourself, yes. please. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Sasha Snimic, and I represent of Branch Trade Union Union of Construction and Timber Industry Nezavisnost. Did you know? <laughs> uh, I have uh, exactly uh, two questions. Uh, what are the uh, recent development of ITUC campaign in Qatar? And uh, the second is, a lot of Serbian workers go to Russia and uh, they will go uh, for work on construction sites uh, for World Cup uh, 2018. Uh, does uh, ITUC have any strategy for World Cup in Russia as uh, for Qatar? Well, let me answer the Qatar question. When, um 
when I looked at the global union, the state of the glo of, of unions in the globe, when I first took over this job at the end of 2010, and it seemed to me that there was a very big risk for us. We were trying to build activist unions that were fighting for rights, were fighting for uh, social justice, for fair wages, whatever the struggle was. And at the same time, we had richer and richer governments in the Gulf states, actually as one part of the world, trying to undermine that by oppressing workers, operating modern day slavery environments, and, uh, and basically when you looked over the Gulf waters to our affiliates in Bahrain, Kuwait who were struggling, and remember this was pre-Arab Spring, then it seemed to us that these nations were buying the elements of the global system from the UN to the ILO that they wanted without the rights, without the fundamental rights. And it was both an appalling uh, uh, level of oppression but it was also, of course, a threat to the kind of free and democratic activist unions we wanted to build everywhere but in that region. And then you know how to run campaigns. You use what leverage you have. You examine where is the strongest possibility of winning and taking on an issue that you can then move on to, uh, to other settings. So when FIFA actually gave Qatar the World Cup, it was the perfect moment because we knew that this was the hook on which we could uh, take on the corruption of global sporting bodies like FIFA. And remember, we already had a campaign before I came here called Playfair, which was about just that ambition. And the second was to raise to the level of a global scandal the enslavement of workers in the 21st century. So we describe Qatar as having created the perfect storm I don't think anybody thinks about FIFA now without thinking about Qatar and two issues, one corruption and the other the oppression of workers. What we haven't done yet is crack open this nut. We've made all sorts of promises, uh, you know, they're going to put in new forms of rights, they're going to end the kafala system. Most of the announcements to date have been simply empty promises. <clears throat> the kafala system or the modern form of slavery, when you're owned by one person, is absolutely still in place. And any of you who've been to Qatar, and uh, and in fact, if you were go there with your unions or with us, what you'll see is migrants who go there with optimism, they're offered a contract which is often torn up when they arrive. They then um, are forced to live in squalor, unbelievable squalor that nobody for ourselves, our children, our grandchildren would accept and uh, eat poor food, work extreme hours uh, for low pay and then of course they live with the indignity not just of squalor but no privacy, 8, 10, 12 grown men to a room. For women in domestic servitude it's worse, they have no rights at all under the labour law. And then when you want to leave, you're owned by a person. So unless that person signs your exit visa or a transfer certificate so you can work somewhere else, you're basically simply trapped in Qatar. So people now understand that, but we just have to keep the pressure up and now we'll move with the BWI in partnership to ramp up the pressure on corporations as well as on governments and World Cup sponsors. We never intended this to just be a campaign about Qatar, but of course we'll keep the pressure up till we win for work there. It is in fact one that has sound waves well beyond Qatar. Already the Gulf countries are talking about an employment uh, contract for domestic workers. It's nowhere good, good enough, but with the Domestic Workers Convention, we can try to actually uh, you know, put pressure to bring rights and uh, freedom into the frame. So our broader campaign now of eliminating slavery, forced labour if you call it that, is to look at countries beyond Qatar whilst still retaining Qatar as a focus and the global scandal that it is. In that context, then, the I think all of you who watched Sochi just understood that this is 
this is not a place where people are respected, where fundamental human rights are respected. And of course, for workers who are sometimes in forced labour, in construction, in, in the construction work there, this was, a, this was terrible. So we are determined that what we do in Qatar will roll on because one of our uh, demands of FIFA is they put into the criteria for selection for future cups, of course, uh, the fundamental rights of workers. The thing about is not well known is that FIFA in the dead of night in Russia actually uh, convinced the politicians to pass through a law which basically exempted all employers dealing with World Cup issues sites from fundamental rights. Now, we've had a commitment to have that overturned, but the unions, with our support and, and, and even the support of the employers on the Social Council, had to demand of the government that they undo that. So never underestimate the corruption and the power of a body like this. So yes, Russia's on our, in our targeted sites. Yes, we'll demand the same contractual conditions that we're demanding in Qatar for construction and so on. But some of it's already going on and some of it we've already lost some time around. So we have to make sure that the scandal of Qatar builds pressure for us to monitor what's going on in Russia, where the difference is you do have labour rights. They mightn't be perfect, but you do have fundamental labour rights, at least uh, through ratified ILO conventions. So it's a work in progress, but it's on the agenda. and. One of the forced labour countries where we want to have a look at for the broader campaign is indeed Russia, Moldova, Armenia, all of that kind of mix. Serbia would be in the mix as well in terms of workers going there. So it's a big campaign, but Qatar is, is just the nucleus. Thank you very much, Sharon. And uh, now we're moving to the next question from another area. And we give floor to Ryan. Yeah. Uh, hi, Sharon. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Brian Simpson from Unite the Union in the UK. Um, my question is surrounding the environment, um, but I'm just going to start with a small kind of disclaimer, Sharon, if, if you allow me. Um, recent polls in the UK have um, showed that 70% of the public support uh, renationalisation um, of our energy industries. Um, indeed, many of our EUR affiliates um, in the ITUC embrace the policy of public ownership. Given the urgency of the climate um, crisis and the and that climate has been a key concern of, of the ITUC, um, given the specific examples in the UK very recently, um, we are in Scotland and Grangemouth. Uh, one one man was able to hold an entire workforce of a thousand workers to, um, to ransom, really. Um, is public ownership something that you can see the ITUC adopting and supporting and proactively getting involved in in the near future? There's no doubt that uh, public ownership of essential industries is something that is a huge debate. And we oppose privatisation where it's senseless because it means governments are going to uh, continue to pay the price anyway. You can't, for example, if you privatise a public transport system, and I think uh, you own in the UK the preeminent example of what happens with the railways when they don't work. Australia is another case in point where if something breaks down, it costs a lot of money. And in the end, it's not private at all. It's privatising, it's socialising uh, uh, the losses and privatising the profits. So this is not a model anyone can support. You know, we would look at it if we're on a case-by-case -case basis, but essential services, absolutely. You know, today, yesterday, I spent some time with the Education International and <clears throat> we're looking at a campaign in support of uh, their efforts around a global company called Pearson's which is actually increasingly running for-profit schools. And I don't know about you, but I think the idea of making money from children and the uh, guarantee of a quality education that is actually taxpayers' money is just immoral. But to give, take it to the nth degree, you have a school in Ghana, for example, that's a for-profit school that makes children wear red bands 
if they actually haven't paid their fees, green if they have, and yellow if they're a day late, but red if they're about to be kicked out of the school because their parents are too poor to pay for education. I mean, these things have to be stopped. So I, I just tell you that because the privatisation issue is so big that you really have to, again, say, where can we win? If Unite can win on this basis or the British unions, then in terms of the climate piece, I would say, apart from workers' rights and proper use of uh, taxpayers' dollars, my criteria would be, does your government support the shift in the energy mix we have to make? And uh, if they don't, then, to be honest, apart from what you might achieve, although with the Cameron government I'm not sure you'll even achieve workers' rights, but will you achieve climate justice? So for me it's about, you know, where is the, where is the fight for the guarantees, the guarantees for workers and the guarantees for climate justice? What we do know is that industrial transformation is critical and only the unions can really take a strong role in that to force employers to the table with governments around how we make sure that the jobs in construction, in energy, as you said, in um, agriculture, in uh, manufacturing, name an industry we have now, are greener tomorrow than they are today, so we have a chance of sustaining and growing those jobs. So absolutely, census privatisation is just idiotic. Re-nationalising uh, re, uh, industries will be dependent on the capacity of the union to fight, but also I would say, not just because it's an ideological position, but what is the outcomes we want that that will, uh, that will actually generate. And then of course, how do we get the leverage to make it possible and unites the leverage union. I look at them with great uh, admiration. I think Sharon is one of the best strategic organising brains in the world and uh, we need more of you. So go get it and then we might be able to help the rest of the world think through this. Thanks, Sharon. Thank you very much. And um, our next question uh, is about education and I should say that we had a special session on Tuesday about education, trade union education, but the issue of education of future generations uh, came up almost in every session um, during our discussion. So Vanessa has a specific question for you on this topic. Yeah. Good afternoon, Sharon. I'm Vanessa. I'm working for the UNIA it's, uh, in Switzerland. Um, we were thinking about that the capitalist and neoliberal ideology is taking over at workplaces and also in schools, and it's a big problem. Also, as well in some trade union, um, which about their principles, and we were thinking about what role do you think trade unions um, should have in educating the future generation, and what can we do with our own programs and policy in the trade unions? <coughs> you have to look at the specifics around which educational sector you're talking about. You know, if we're talking about uh, fundamental schooling, then my own values and the values of the trade union movement are clear. You should have I used to be a teacher, so forgive me for feeling very passionate about this, but you you know, free universal education is fundamental, absolutely fundamental. Quality education is fundamental. If you don't have that, then I don't know what the basis of civilization is, whether it's the value set, the knowledge base, the capacity for, uh, uh, you know, creativity and contribution to our future, then education's at the in terms of vocational education and training, then unions have a big role to play. You know, I come from a country and we've just, in fact, uh, one of the few things we have an agreement with the global business community about is to promote the, uh, the apprenticeship system, to expand it into female-generated areas, to guarantee both a decent wage, earning wage, but also quality skills that come from the partnership when either uh, unions and workers for a collective, uh, unions and employers for a collective agreement or as an industry council, structure the curriculum, make sure the money is there for vocational education and that the standards are high with all of the guarantees around safety, wages, um, employment, etc. that you would expect. So 
in vocational education and training post school, and indeed sometimes a mix of schooling and work, then I think unions have a very important role to play, particularly the industrial unions, but also in support of the education unions. In terms of higher education, I think, uh, you know, if, if we are worried about uh, universal access to schooling, this, the absolute, oh, I don't know, I can't think of a word, but it just, it's, if I tell you my personal story, it might help to explain how I feel. I was uh, a child of, a, of parents who'd never dreamt of going to university. I was the first person in my generation, in my family, first generation, to go to university and it was because we had a progressive Prime Minister of the day who threw open the university so working class kids could afford to go to university. Now in your country, in my country, in the US, the, the mortgage on uh, the, the debt burden that students bear for access to our university and community colleges in some countries is more than the mortgage, the, de the deposit you would pay on a home mortgage as a young person. And I think that, you know, we are on the, on the cusp, I hope we're on the cusp of seeing the kind of student activism again that says enough. This is, this is wrong, it's uh, morally wrong, it's economically crazy because you can't uh, force young people to start their lives with a debt that's just... Uh, you know, there are now people at 40 and 50 who still have, uh, um, well, not 40 and 50, not 50, but up to their 40s, who now have university debts they still haven't paid off, and that's just crazy. So education is fundamental. We have a role in advocacy. We have a role in, uh, in curriculum and uh, standards monitoring around VET. We have workers who are deliverers of education. So one way or another, it's... It's all entwined, and it's our taxpayers' dollars. So again, when we make choices as democracies, when our governments make choices for us, then for me, education has to be one of the first choices for, you know, a, a, a universal access at all levels. It's a big fight for all of us. So, sorry, Sharon, um, thank you for that. That was um, helpful in understanding our opposition to privatisation and education. But I think what we were really wanting to know was what your feeling was with regards to educating almost a future activist base. Um, ah, against trade union education. Yes, yeah, so trade union education, specifically how do we educate a, a future generation of people against capitalism, against neoliberalism? And what would be your oh, view on that? My apologies. I, uh, I misunderstood the question. Um, well, I mean, unions have always had a, uh, a strong commitment to trade union education. And I can tell you what the ITC is doing. We are, we are now putting money into building workers' power through directly training boys who are organising workers. So I'm a bit ruthless about this. Ultimately, I would like everybody to have these skills. But if we have people who are building a collective voice, organising workers, whether it's in an EP said zone, an informal uh, economy site, or whether it's in a more traditional uh, factory school hospital, then we want to help build the leaders of organisers. So that is our focus right now. Of course, we do other forms of training, some legal training and so on, but that's our focus to actually build activism through the work of organising that will build union growth and workers' power ultimately to uh, take on the fights. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, there is also one more question about uh, future generation of trade unionists, it's about young workers, and uh, I'd like you to ask the question. <coughs> Hello, Sharon. I'm Edit from the GMB in the UK. Um, just a little bit of preface. It's um, from the perspective of young trade unionists and also young workers. I ask this question: uh, What is the ITCU tangibly doing to include and empower young people in our movement currently at the moment? Uh, and what goals do you think we need to achieve in the next five years uh, for young people to really be empowered in the movement? 
Well, I, to be honest, I would really love your advice around that question because you know what it, what it takes for young people to be activists, what supports you need, you know, what uh, campaigns are at the, or struggles are at the forefront for yourselves. What I can tell you that we're doing is we're changing the culture of our structures. So, uh, you know, to we divided up uh, our youth committee uh, so that uh, half of the representatives will in fact be organising workers directly and uh, we plan to run alongside our traditional policy discussions on lead organisers courses. The first one will kick off uh, in, uh, in about six weeks time. We, uh, we are determined uh, that the Get Organised platform that we have built will actually tell the stories and, and look to where we can support young people's organising campaigns. We have a generational problem, there's no doubt about that. Even though the official statistics at our Congress say there was almost 20% of young people, you know, if I tell you that the criteria is uh, up to 35, then you'll chuckle because you're not so young really by the, <laughs> by the time you get to 35. But the, nevertheless, we still don't hear the voices of young people mainstreamed unless, sorry, we don't hear the voices of young people mainstreamed. Unless we create specific spaces, then we are not actually doing what we know we need to do, which is build, uh, which is allow for inclusion of young people. So my own view is we also have become uh, you know, governance and institutions are important, but if they are so bureaucratic that it's not a model that young people want to uh, participate in, that they want a more activist model, a more flexible capacity to uh, take on uh, defined struggles, to know what a win looks like, to have the skills then to transfer their capacities to other areas of injustice, then we have to find those models. Some of the workers in uh, non-traditional settings in the informal economy are really helping us think through that. But frankly, we need more demands from young people about what it is that will support the work you are doing and include others. Sharon, if I could just, uh, as Brian again, respond to what you said um, about what should be done. Um, this is what we've really debated for the last three days about what needs to be done to bring young people into the movement. I think we need to be doing a lot more um, to organise the precarious workforce um, throughout the world, um, particularly in the global south, uh, but all across. Um, young workers are invariably working in extremely precarious conditions. They don't have contracts, they don't have access to any trade union activity. We need to be focusing our resources into those workplaces, even though it doesn't make economical or industrial sense just now, it will pay dividends in the very near future to organise the future generation. I think that needs to be the first thing. And then the second thing, we need to give those young people direct access to decision making within the union, what you were just discussing there about young members committees. We have them in the UK, but there is still a certain extent of tokenism within the movement. Young people need to feel uh, that they are actually part of the leadership now. And I don't mean the General Secretary, I mean part of the decision making and policy making of, of the union. And the third thing I think is once they are included in that um, decision making and body, um, there needs to be a serious investment in political education of those young people. Um, I don't mean party political education, I mean education against neoliberalism education as to their collective uh, need um, and, and purpose in society. Um, and, and that is what's going to empower the next generation. That was the advice of young workers you just asked <laughs> in the beginning. Oh, okay. But that's terrific advice. And can I tell you, we had, I'm smiling because we had, in our planning weeks, every morning of our planning weeks, we have between 9.30 and 11 as a kind of professional development uh, Piece. And this morning we were actually um, focusing very much on the fact that, you know, the employers can attack the right to strike, they can, they can attack uh, uh, collective bargaining rights, they can 
in your the case of precarious workers, we couldn't agree more. They can try to reduce workers to, you know, zero hour contracts or short term contracts. But in the end, you know, people will, whether the unions are organising people or not, people will build opposition. Because when it gets to be at the point where they feel that injustice is so oppressive, and that's the stuff of which struggles, ultimately regu re revolutions are born. So we have to be conscious too, and I can't disagree with anything you've said about our structures and involvement. Indeed, you know, we, we have actually, I think, failed to think collectively about future generations, and we need to turn that around. For me, that's an irony, because when I first uh, stood for a senior position, in my own union branch, I was 34, and I was told repeatedly I was too young. You're too young, you know? And I was a national president at 38, and oh, that's way too young. So I want to see where those young people are in our structures. But don't take this as an opposition to that. In fact, I would love to see a young person as a general secretary of... Uh, and I think we will, frankly, the generations are shifting. But I also think there's something about collectivism and activism that our structures are missing. We're here and the acti activism is here and how do we do exactly what you said? How do we support the, the work of people who are collectively trying to struggle to make their lives better? The, the best example for me is when I came into this job, really no one wanted to talk about how we integrated working in the informal sector, which is in fact undermining collective contracts or uh, secure contracts because the more you have formal work actually eating away at the formal employment structures, then the easier it is for employers to say you have three month contract or you have a zero hours contract or whatever other piece of evil it is. So I think we have to, uh, what we can be proud of is now everybody in the movement is talking about what's our targets in the informal economy. I don't want to overstate that because we're still you know, this uh, this deep, but when we have done the mapping on waste pickers, for example, so some of our marginalised uh, climate or new energy workers and how to organise or how to support them because they've organised them themselves, they've organised themselves both nationally and globally, then we are really talking about a different union movement. And I don't want to, I'm the first to say we need strong institutions, but if the institutions are exclusive, of any worker, then we're failing. It's that simple for me. Thank you very much, Sharon. And um, of course, there is one topic that we couldn't leave aside here in our discussions, and this is uh, labor movement in China. And we have specific question for you on this issue. Hi, uh, good afternoon. I'm Samuel Lee. I'm from uh, AMLC, Asia Monitor Resource Center uh, from Hong Kong. And uh, we here have a question for you about uh, China labor. And then uh, we would like to ask um, what is the stand and policy of ITUC on uh, the state controlled um, ACFTU? And also, how should the um, global trade unions respond to the more stronger and stronger? Uh, uh, labor movement from the ground, which are those uh, workers who are not uh, organized by ACFTU, but they are um, coming out um, autonomously and then uh, coming out themselves to have uh, collective action. How should the global trade union respond to these workers and these their actions? Thank you. Well, I think people have different political views about how to engage with China. Some argue that we need critical engagement, like the ITC, in order to uh, drive the shift to fundamental rights, to uh, you know wages policy, the collective agreements, etc. And others argue we should stay outside and isolate them. That's all those positions are, are justifiable positions, depending on where you uh, want to achieve results. And frankly. You know, those who sit outside, but those of us who critically engage to drive at least the level of change that we are seeing today. For me, it's very simple. Almost 50% of the world's workers are in China. I don't believe they should be punished by the system of government. I think we should be talking to them as often as we can about their rights, about the, the capacity for them to gain just wages, 
We can talk about state-owned companies, and yes, we can talk about state control. But let's talk about Western companies, because the recent uprisings for workers have been against the oppression of our own Western corporations. And that's about the profit, the greed of the profit taker for 1%. What I can tell you is that we are seeing massive change in China. When I can go to factories and talk to workers who are producing photovoltaics that are being sold in to the European market and that are generating 350,000 jobs in, uh, in Europe alone, in construction, in services, in sales, then we need to get those rights for workers in Europe and those rights for workers in China. We won't turn around the dominant model of, uh, of the oppression of supply chains unless we demand that companies purge their supply chains of forced labour, of informal work, that they pay fundamental minimum living wages. And if you ignore the foreign direct investment, of China into Africa, Latin America, and if you ignore the foreign direct investment into China of our Western companies from the US, from Europe, from uh, the UK, Australia, etc., then we are only fighting part of the picture. So it's complex. You know, if you're asking me, will the ACFTU ever be a member of the ITC, then I would say not in my lifetime. If you're asking me, are they trying to uh, learn from us, create open spaces, are they fighting for labour laws that allow collective bargaining and minimum wages? Yes, minimum wages have gone up more in China from a low base, but in China, more than uh, anywhere else in the world, percentage terms, over the last uh, five years. In fact, the wages in Bulgaria are less than the wages in China now. You have uh, a social protection system that is being rolled out at the weight of knots and the amount of workers' capital that will be there to invest in, uh, in the world in, uh, that the Chinese just as we have trustees on our uh, pension funds, they do too. They're fighting for 50% representation and they will have, they will equal our 25 trillion of workers' capital within 25 years. And we change this system of government? Can the ITC change the system of government? No. But can we support workers who are demanding fundamental rights uh, to actually have a view about their workplaces, about workplace democracy, about their rights, and ultimately about democracy? Let's hope so. So I don't think anybody has a, a fundamentally different view about the challenge of rights for workers in China. I think if we have differences, it's about how we're trying to affect the outcome of that. And frankly, I can argue the case for you of engagement, I can argue the case of, uh, you know, um, standing outside, but in the end, we believe that those workers serve the best chance for working with them and then ultimately the rest of the workers in the world to have a common set of rights in a, in a system of a global economy that's vastly different from the one that's failing all of us today. Thank you, Sharon. And uh, we have the last question from the Commission, but I already get a uh, request from the people in the room who wants to ask their question. And uh, the last question uh, from the Commission will be about informal economy, which is also a huge issue and we discussed it a lot. Hello, uh, my name is Francesco Pontarelli and I'm from GLI in Manchester. Actually, yeah, my question, uh, the subject of my question is something about that you have already mentioned in your previous answer. But um, during this, this summer school, uh, we have had several trade unionists and activists that have contributed to the discussion underlining the process of informalization and the necessity, the strong need to, to tackle the, um, um, the issue of, of organizing informal workers. And they have also shared with us successful experiences of informal workers' organization. We would like to ask you your position about the necessity of organizing informal workers, if there are still resistances within the trade, in the international trade union leadership about organizing informal workers, and what you, uh, what ITU see, and you are doing, what are you doing to overcome these resistances? Thank you. 
Well, I think I've basically answered that. I think the resistance is gone. I can tell you the same stories and more probably that you've been talking about, about great successes. We can talk about our ambitions to, to actually get a standard at the ILO for formalising informal work, which is halfway through negotiation. We've had one year of a two-year negotiation. And, you know, proudly with the BWI and the... Uh, and the um, International uh, Domestic Workers Network, we can tell you that we have conservatively together formalised the jobs of around 12 million domestic workers. We have seen about 50,000 of them join unions. We've seen nine new unions. And we're now starting to see even a few collective agreements. So those sorts of successes you know, or the street vendors who just joined uni, one million strong, organised by CIWA in India, and now demanding uh, the kind of legislation from municipalities that give them guarantees of their own spaces to work, the social protection that underpins jobs. You know, these are they're great stories. They're really terrific stories. And it, it makes me proud of the labour movement when we are genuinely looking at all we workers with equality. There should be no class differences, no no uh, divides between legal and illegal migrants, that's just crazy stuff. There should be no divides between whether or not we care about and organise informal workers and formal workers. What we should be doing, or work I should say, what we should be doing is making sure those forced into informal work or forced labour or slavery, whatever term you put on any of this, are actually getting the support to collectively take on how to actually make their work decent work. So wherever a worker is, a worker is a worker is a worker, wherever they are in the world, and they're part of our family. That's important. Thank you. Now the floor is open for everyone who wants to ask the question, but first I want to give the uh, floor to uh, our sister from Bangladesh, Lali Yasmin, President of Ready Made Garment Workers Federation. Can you tell you, I'm actually got a staff meeting starting now. I can donate four minutes. So if people could just maybe ask three or four questions and I'll try and answer them together. I'm sorry, but I'm really short for time today. Okay. So, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, hi, I'm Lovely Yasmin from Bangladesh. I'm president of Ready Mid Gardens Workers Federation. I'm going to speak Bangla. खूब अपरिष्कार जानते चाहिए तुम्हारे अवस्थान की ग्राउंड were not informed and when the process was taking place the ITUC was not there initially and when it came into picture uh, the, the 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 affiliates at the ground were not consulted properly there is still confusion at ground whether one has to go with accord or alliance uh, it is not clear uh, second there is no uh, 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 there is no uh, connection with industry hall because it seems there is no proper communication with the industry hall on this uh, side and lastly even though there has been such a bad uh, accident there has been so much money flowing in for different airport and airlines till now not a single worker uh, has been compensated thank you thank you so much Uh, hi Sharon, uh, I'm Yvonne from Switzerland, from, uh, from Solifans, an international solidarity organisation founded by the Swiss trade unions. Uh, my question concerns uh, um, 
transnational, transnational corporations and their uh, impunity uh, for human rights violations, labor rights violations, etc. A couple of weeks ago, uh, the Human Rights Commission on Human Rights, uh, the UN Commission on Human Rights, uh, voted for uh, a treaty um, on um, transnational corporations. Uh, just before that, there was a People's Permanent Tribunal, and unfortunately, um, there wasn't a big uh, presence of trade unions. So my question is, how do you see the role of the ITUC in the elaboration and, or to make sure that um, a treaty will be elaborated and implemented that effectively puts uh, workers' rights and people's rights before uh, profit, which means also before free trade agreements and uh, investor protection. Thank you. Hi, my name is Steven. I'm from Switzerland, from the trade union Unia. Uh, the last three days we talked a, little, uh, talked a lot about the need for build allies between the union and social movements. And my question is, how do you think, what do you think about the, to build allies with radical left groups, especially in India or something else, with communist groups, Maoist groups, or, or so on? Thank you. I will take one more, Sheldon. Repeat the end of that question. Ah. What do you think about allies between uh, Unions and the radical left groups. Alliances. Huh? Alliances, yeah. Between radical left groups and unions, especially in the South, India, or something else. Yeah, it's okay. And the last? Um, just a question about, from your position, your personal opinion, and from the policies uh, of your organization, are trade unions. Um, a force for changing not only not only getting uh, workers a better condition in the system we have now, but also ultimately influencing what system we have to make it uh, a much fairer system. So in, in, a, in effect changing our whole global system we have now um, and connected what, what role can you play and what influence can you have and what ideas do you have now about some sort of international people's ideology that can filter through to all your affiliates. Thank you. It's okay, can, can you answer? So, uh, let me start with Bangladesh and the alarm. This is a very simple answer, and you know, if all of the publicity, our websites, etc., haven't made it clear, then I apologise to the sister. But the accord is a union agreement. It's, uh, it's an historical agreement with uh, industrial, uni, the corporate brands, and our well, European corporate brands in the main, some Australian and others, and uh, with the support of the ITC. It is working on the question of both compensation and on safety of the factories in Bangladesh and has a set of conditions around joint action and monitoring. The Alliance is the uh, puppetry, the propaganda of the US corporations who would not join the court, who would not accept legal responsibility. And they are using one or two of our union leaders in Bangladesh as part of their propaganda, telling the world that they are in fact doing the right thing when they will not sit down at the table with unions at the, uh, at the global level or even the unions in the sector directly in the sector in, in uh, Bangladesh. But it, it was all about avoiding legal responsibility and simply in terms of the American corporate model which is anti-union, avoiding union collective. So we've asked our affiliates in, um, in uh, Bangladesh and we've asked in fact uh, um, uh, and industrials asked uh, unions and our, us as well to not engage with the alliance, to not be part of their propaganda. And in fact, it, you know, it's, uh, it's a hard question, but I've asked at least one of our affiliates to actually withdraw from their relationship with the, with the alliance. So that's very clear. If you need more information, please email me and we'll see more information. On the question of um, 
uh, industrial. They do have workers. Uh, they have organisers on the ground. They are building uh, uh, unions in the textile sector. We are continuing the fight to have workers in the defence covered by the labour laws and the latest announcement by the government was just insulting given there are already welfare uh, associations who want union rights, workers' rights in those uh, EPCs, the majority of whom are women. The, um, the question of compensation, there has been some compensation paid, it's not true to say none. We are worried about both disasters though and making sure that the compensation flows to workers. And I know industrial and unity have worked overtime on that. Uh, so um, if there are specific questions about sites or about uh, individuals, please let us know and we'll track it down. In terms of corporate impunity, well, you know, that's why we're taking on a major global campaign. Using, uh, I want to raise the impoverishment of work through supply chains to the, left of the global scandal that we've raised the time. It'll take us a, a year or two to get there, but we are putting those plans in place now. And we're particularly focused on the provision of workers. You know, when they shoot uh, and jail our workers in Cambodia for striking for minimum wage, something is very, very wrong. And the union movement can't stand back and watch that happen. So we're looking at cross country. Uh, approaches to demanding that we see uh, fundamental rights. On the question of the treaty and the Human Rights Committee, we're a bit suspicious of this at this point because some of the governments who are demanding this are not uh, necessarily union friendly governments and others have rejected it, maybe 14 governments. Now this could be uh, simply uh, a selfish uh, um, defence of corporations, but the UN has the rugged principle. And that requires due diligence of supply chain. So if they were serious, this would be the basis of a treaty. And to date, none of that's on the table. So we'll watch it and make a judgment about whether it's another piece of uh, PR wash from the, from the uh, you know, governments who are pretending to do something about corporations. I don't know if I've talk, told you this before, but we have a CSR, a corporate social responsibility, industry that's $80 billion strong and every initiative, every initiative has seen workers' rights go backwards. So at the moment we're a bit suspicious, but if it genuinely was a new treaty, then of course we would be interested in, uh, in seeing it uh, developed. We are going to have a, a discussion on supply chains in the ILO in 2016, and so you'll see a lot of activity next year as we prepare for that with the Global Union Federation. In terms of the, um, the allies piece, you know, I said it for me, you know, I, I don't, I'm a, a woman of the left, and I've said this publicly. I'm not frightened of any economic system. It's whether or not workers have freedoms, rights, and whether you can operate that system of democracy, that form of the basis of my principle. And I would hope for the basis of new decisions about alliances that feel. We have alliances in, in uh, you know, uh, countries that have come out of communism. We have alliances in countries that are in communism that sometimes uh, will be part of, or well, not at the moment, be part of the formal global structure. But there are others that we won't touch. I won't, for example, uh, play with the WFTU because they support the dictator's club that is killing people in the Middle East. They are trying to undermine our independent unions that part of the world and others, so for me that's a no-go sign. If you're committed to rights, to democracy, the economic system is a, is a decision of the people if they are empowered to make that decision. So, uh, but on the question of capitalism, which is the last uh, question, then it's, it's failing. I mean, the current model has failed people. In fact, it's so bad that the crisis which create, was created by greed, the financial crisis, underpinned simply a set of justifications for governments to go to war on their own people. Well, that's not acceptable. When you've got otherwise democratic governments slashing wages, taking away collective bargaining rights, undermining social protection, then this is not a system we can support. So our ambition is certainly to drive a much more uh, constructive uh, 
and, and legal framework for workers' rights, but we have to we have to do everything possible to reshape the global economic system. There can be just no question about that, and that's why we were deliberate in naming our Congress Building Workers' Power. If you don't have power in your workplaces, your collective voice and action, if you don't have power in, in political terms in order to, to hold democracy, then uh, we won't do the things about the global economic system we despise today. So everything we can do collectively, let's do it. And I'm sorry I have to go. And thank you. <laughs> the intelligent thinking about the role of unions, but most of all, your commitment to the collective voice of trade unions, because I passionately believe, or I wouldn't do this job, that we are the great democratic force on earth, and we must get stronger. So thank you very much. Thank you. On behalf of everybody here, Sharon, uh, thank you so much for being with us again. And I know your time is very, very short, and it's been a brilliant pivot of our summer school this year, which again has been fantastic. So thank you very much for your time indeed. Okay, we can uh, maybe now. <laughs>